Welcome to the first in a series of conversations about the commons, the meaning of which will be explored in this conversation as a forgotten societal institution, which will be considered in the same breath alongside concepts like the market and the state. Today welcomes Michelle Bowens, an analyst of civilizational transition and theorist with a background in political economy and technology. He also spent time in the wild, wild country of Osho, the notorious spiritual teacher, as well as with organizations including the Masons, Templars and Rosicrucians, as I was interested to find out later in this dialogue. Michelle has had a distinguished career as a researcher, entrepreneur, analyst and advisor across academic and private institutions around the world, and is listed in the top 100 on the Post Carbon Institute Enrich list, which recognizes contributions that enrich paths towards sustainable futures. He set up the foundation for peer-to-peer -peer alternatives in 2007, which addresses the central question how can we enable and encourage the formation of global cooperative networks within the existing global adversarial network? How could these bubbles form, grow, merge and eventually shift the whole civilization towards a more cooperative, generative process? I hope this dialogue provides a clear point of access to thinking about the commons as a means of systemic response to our world in transition. At least partially. There's a lot here and many open questions. Okay, here we go. Michelle Bowens, it's lovely to be here with you. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I think it's a very important domain of understanding. These are ideas which can be actually quite commonsensical to grasp. But from another perspective, they can also appear to people who might not be familiar with the language and the way of thinking as really quite radical. There is a sense that in your work and uh, with many of your collaborators, there's a real effort at engaging with the frontier of how to think about economics and how to think about governance and how to connect what ultimately a more regenerative way of being in the world with something that looks a little bit more like a system, something which looks a little bit more like a name at the very least, which is going to appear alongside other names like capitalism potentially other names like communism, but it's looking to relate to the history of economics and exchange and how we structure the provisioning and interchange of resources at really a fundamental level. Right. And it's so critical to civilization, so critical to human life. So an interesting sort of first place to begin, and I want to ask you a bit of a personal question in a bit, but if we could take a step back, what is economics? How do you relate to that term, really? Right. Well, you know, the first thing I have to tell you is that I'm not an economist, right? I'm not trained as an economist, but I, I relate more to the um, political economy tradition of the 19th century, which was, you know, looking at society in a more holistic way, right? So economics is really very tied to this kind of idea that we all separate individuals making rational decisions. Uh, so they, when you say economics, you actually have a whole baggage. Um, but it also excludes all things like history and class and you know different things. Political economy was more like looking at at you know how we produce and exchange within the kind of the very broad reality. Uh, social reality we live in. So looking at also at classes, at history, you know, and so I'm more in that in that tradition, right? And you probably know that originally economics meant, you know, the how to manage the household. Um, but it has become something entirely different that is actually divorced from from the. So I I think we should go back to the old older tradition. So expand the view of economics to a societal issue uh, because how we exchange things really affects everything we do. Like what we value and what we don't value. And that that has so many implications uh, for everything. And of course, you know, we need to eat, we need shelter. So you can't, you can't also not 
think about it, right? You cannot just say, oh, there's only spirit or or meaning. Like, well, you know, if you can't eat, uh, you know, it's going to be very hard to to construct meaning as well, right? So it's so political economy means like replacing how we produce and exchange in, in the very broad existence of, you know, human society. Right. And um, so if you wouldn't call yourself an economist, you have co-authored a textbook, or at least what I was reading in preparation for this is sort of a bit of a guideline, I believe was called Towards a Commons Economics. Okay, that's like an attempt, like a first attempt to, okay, how, how would economics or political economy look like if you take a, a new point of view? And so, so I, I, I'm sure you will agree with this. You know, starting in the 16th century, then especially in the 17th, Western society decided that uh, value came from scarcity, from some, something being a commodity. And that's the only value that is recognized in our economic system. And then the way that we think value works is so you create something scarce, you sell it, you create a surplus, and that surplus is taxed by the state and is then redistributed, right? So that whole thing posits really two, two institutions um, facing each other, which is the state and the market. And so all the debates from the 19th century onwards were actually debates about the relative place of the state versus the market. Should we have more state? Should we have less state? Should we have more free markets, less free markets? But there is a an institution that was forgotten. Uh, and, you know, on purpose, uh, because it's, it wasn't part of this new, new modality that we call capitalism. And that modality is the commons, is uh, communal shareholding. So if you look at any non-capitalist society, it has a structural place for the commons. So, for example, you're a medieval farmer. You have your own plot of land. You probably have a duty to do uh, you know, some work for the Lord because you know, he's a protector of the realm where you live. So it's like you, you need to take care of defense. And so you need to feed you know, the warriors that will defend your your, your place. Uh, you will give to the church because, you know, that's the, the organization of meaning in your society. But you also have a common. And the common is like those lands in your village that can be used by the whole village. And actually the, the most important or, you know, not maybe not the most important, but the third most important religious festival in the Middle Ages was called the Rogan Tide Procession, beating the bounds. And, you know, there was the, the priest would go with every parishioner around the bounds of the village and reconfirm the, you know, the, the, the frontiers of their commons. So it was really crucial to the identity of the people, you know, not just their family and then their their subjection to church and, and and the lords, but actually the commons itself was like a key part of uh, of the system. It, it was, you know, it's, it's a bit like a social security that we have today, right? So having a common meant that it was always like a basic availability of certain foodstuffs and herbs and, you know, some place for your for your herds to 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 use so it was a protection against like the if you would only have a feudal relationship you know that wouldn't have been healthy uh and so it kind of created a balance within that system and every non-capitalist system had that but once then we moved to capitalism and you know this is called the enclosures so we started thinking well actually you know, things are more productive if they're owned by a private person. So the commons is bad. Uh, it's not productive enough. So And so then gradually we privatized the commons to the point where we forgot about it. Like it's, it was no longer part of our culture and our consciousness that this has been like a millennial institution. Um, and the reason the commons is important in economics 
is that the market and the state are extractive institutions. They exist to grow, to conquer, to, you know, and so they they are always in this cyclic reality, which is you have an ascendant phase and then a descendant phase. And every single civilization and society has been subject to that. And then, then you have the preservative institution, which is the commons, which, you know, weakens during the ascending phase because then people are taken care of by, you know, the state or by the market. But when it goes into the descending phase, then people feel the need to return and re, re and strengthen again, you know, the, the commons institutions, right? So this has been going on for ages. You know, kind of ebb and flow of the commons, I call it the pulsation of the commons. But once we move to the global capitalist system starting in the 16th century, we kind of forgot about this pulsation because we thought, you know, we can always expo exploit a new area, right? So instead of having within a region this pulse pulsation of growth and decay, what we had is we serially exhausted Right. Uh, places until we now reach the moment where we basically exhausted everything. Uh, and so that changes the situation in the sense that we now have to think of the commons not just as local institutions, but also as global institutions, global preservative institutions. And so that's then when I come to the term, you know, with my friends and colleagues of what we call cosmolocalism, right, which is a particular vision of how to organize the economy, the political economy, where basically you think, well, everything that's heavy should be more local and everything that's light should be global and shared. So the idea is that if you relocalize production, we now spend three times as much transporting than making, right? So, so just by thinking, like rechanging the default from so what we do today is we, we buy everything from the outside and what we can buy from the outside, we make ourselves. And it used to be the default was just the opposite. We make everything ourselves. And you know what we what we like, but we can't make ourselves that we go look for somewhere else, right? And I think that this this model of getting everything outside is has become unsustainable. And so we need to rethink you know, transition to the older model. Of course, entirely new is the digital, right? The existence of non-territorial cooperation. That's a crucial social innovation of our time. It has never existed before. So whereas commoning used to be local, like limited by the people you know in your village and the people you can trust in your village, and limited by the relative strength of a local thing versus a, a bigger thing. So but basically, you know, if you stay a village, there's not much you can do when you're invaded by bigger armies. So there was an onus on being stronger and bigger throughout history well, for the last 5,000 years to the idea that, well, maybe you can organize non-territorially and become bigger that way. Right. And then the, you, then you can actually imagine that you can have lots of micro dynamics, but that are still very, very strong because they have this kind of global coordination effect. Right. Anyway, so that's kind of a way of thinking about this. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think that's good as a sort of, you know, opening up the space. And in terms of this network of networks, lots of small scale, um, groups who interact around a shared common good, intrinsically motivated to do so, find right. value in relational exchange with each other in that process, then create something that's of value to that local commons and then share that broadly with the network of networks, right. with the culture at large. That way of interacting seems to be deeply, deeply important. And, you know, that's something maybe we can pick back up on um so so yeah there's uh so what's happening for me at the moment there's part of me that's uh thinking of this in terms of the linear progression of some concepts and ideas to offer some scaffold and have this as a piece of 
content that can be shared with people to as sort of stepping stones into familiarization, but also clarification. And then there's part of me that um, <laughs> there's part of me that wants to uh, that wants to take this metaphysical in a certain way, perhaps a little bit too quickly. Uh, I, it, it's funny how um, uh, I do think there's we will come back around a little bit. I mean, maybe we can do the first part. You know, we can yeah. start with clarifications and simplifications, and maybe at the end of our talk we can go. You know, in the the deeper. Subject. I mean, it's up, it's up to you. I'll, I'll hold you, know, you I'll to respond. it. Yeah, I'll respond to whatever. I'll hold you to it. Uh, All right. So, um, so here's, I think, an important one. One of the first statements you have in this document is that commons economics is biophysical. And here might be a good opportunity to introduce notions like an orientation toward living within planetary boundaries. Right, exactly. Right. Well, yeah. So we... You know, under capitalism, we have learned to manage the world through monetary signals, right? As as if those monetary signals actually reflect a physical reality. And, and so kind of we believe that the money itself gave enough signals. And, you know, after 40 years, we know that is not true because we, we have been, mar we've had market pricing as the dominant way of allocating resources, and yet we are in generalized overshoot. So clearly, you know, market pricing is actually not reflecting uh, this reality in a sufficient way. And, you know, there's actually a study of a Japanese economist, but I, I'm sorry, I just completely forgot his name. Uh, like in 2013, he published a specific paper actually proving, you know, why market pricing cannot uh, reflect that that physical reality right so so there is a school you know called biophysical economists which you know started with uh, in the 1930s and then you know has different iterations which actually has been working on this on reintegrating you know those realities in how we manage uh, and that can be expressed in different ways you could say you know the the multi-capitalist modality, that's one of the ways to put it. So you have financial, you have human, and you have nature, right? And so the idea is then that you have to be responsible for the three of them, not just for one of them. So not just assuming that the financial covers the two others, but actually making it explicit. Right? We are managing humans, and humans are not a resource. They are human beings. Right, they have interiority. They have a value which is not reducible to being a resource for capital. And the same is true for natural resources. We are interdependent with them. They have you know, their own levels of consciousness and feeling and emotion, and we cannot survive without without them. Right. And then you have this kind of negative, the idea of negative pivots. So you would have. You know, I think we've reached that with neoliberalism. Like it's creating now so much mental damage that you know we're getting into these negative pivots. People are actually becoming mentally ill, and you know I believe we are now creating like fascism in the 1930s. We're creating ideologies which reflect that mental illness. Uh, and the same with nature, there are negative pivots that, like, let's say. Let's say you take copper, right? And there's so much copper in the world. We know there's an average um, average way of finding new copper over time. We know we get a bit more productive in using copper over time. And there's also, you know, ways to study what that rate of increase is. You know, and it all averages out. It's it's not random. And so you can imagine, for example, this is a real project. It's called the Rogue Global Thresholds and Allocations Council. So that would be, you know, that's what I call a magisterium of the commons. So you have state institutions, you have transnational financial institutions, but you could also have translocal, transnational commons institutions, right? Which protect resources, the web of life, and even human communities. And 
and have some institutional power to actually defend themselves. And and that could be that could be embedded in legislation, in accounting, in and so and this is the task of our time is to develop those tools and solutions which allow human consciousness to expand it, its its management so that these externalities are now covered, right? We can no longer ignore human and natural externalities. And that was really the bed of capitalism to say, we can manage everything as money and we don't need to pay attention to those freely available things. Uh, so we don't account for them. So there was this notion of an infinite nature and an infinite abundance for human beings. And we've learned that this is not the case. We actually live in an isolated system. So we get energy from outside, like the sun. We don't get matter, right? So we're not a totally open system that can continue. No, we are limited to, you know, uh, tapping the energy flow from the sun and how that is then transformed into all kinds of other stuff on Earth. But there is no unlimited amount of metal on the planet. It's just, it just isn't there. So if we want to survive as a species over the long term, we know we, know we need certain animals, or I probably we need every animal, because it's a very intricate system that we don't understand. But, you know, particularly the, the worms, the bees, uh, you know, those are like crucial uh, beings for us. And we also know that, you know, there's only so many things you can do with humans before you get revolutions and unrest and civil war. And, and, and so th those, so we, we are reaching these kind of like thresholds where you get, in, and we're already in it. I mean, I, I, I personally think we're already in it. So, you know, you have the ascending phase, which is, Things get you have all these virtuous feedback loops for a while, and then you reach a, a threshold and you enter into negative spirals, right? And I, I think we can clearly see today that we are into, into one of these periods where we enter into a negative spiral. Right. Yeah. So with this emphasis on cosmo localism <laughs> and the idea that things which are heavy or be um, produced, developed more locally so that we don't have such huge right. logistical costs and all these types of things. I mean, that's, that's a very valid perspective. But then we can also look at what seems to be a very rapidly accelerating deglobalization trend, which is happening for reasons that are, of course, ultimately involved uh, right. or, you know, energy and um, it's finitude and, and is certainly implicated somewhere in the complexity of this deglobalizing trend. But we also have geopolitics and and all of that. And we have the, the whole mimetic layer or, um, right. you know, the, the, the symbolic level of shared understanding, um, which we might also see as a kind of commons. We could see potentially language and actually the capacity for meaning making and communication as a kind of commons but so but leaving that to the side for just a moment there's a sense in which um the orientation towards local connection that's still in touch with the global in the way you're advocating for is um you know in some sense this is also a, is rapidly becoming a forced choice and so there's there's something of a coming to consciousness of um, the necessity yes. for changing how we're living in the world. And then there's also the value of thinking through the theory of why this might make sense um, right. across a number of other levels. And similarly, a similar point for the notion of degrowth, which I know is a central part of how you're thinking about the whole context in which commons economics is relevant because the important point is the current trajectory and we could explore it at a psychological level at a, at a at a sort of market competition level this drive towards growth is something which is 
uncoupled from wise treatment of the commons context of energy of nature that we all participate in and so there's this movement this necessary movement towards returning to a level of growth that makes sense given the energetic yeah. constraints we're actually a part of and that's kind of happening to us right now anyway <laughs> right we, we are entering yeah. this period of contraction and it does you know seem like it's going to become increasingly severe and so we're now at this point where these ideas which seem so radical and anathema to the whole economic system the traditional economic system although you still hear those calls for more growth is currently you know the thing that the uk government you know for one is speaking about and trying to do all these things to try and get growth back on track and the yeah. market's just responding saying that ain't gonna happen and it's it's causing a lot of pain but really now i think there's a necessity of becoming aware and open to what does a kind of conscious conscious more consciously participating in degrowth look like so maybe you could say a little bit about um what degrowth means and maybe some right yeah that's probably so, a good place so the, so the basic idea you know i'll kind of repeat something i said before is that um uh, societies used to grow and decay in these kind of cyclic fashions it's very well documented for agricultural society. So you have, you know, some kind of political power that gets organized, you know, um, knows how to get a surplus and then that creates a positive feedback loop and it creates a civilization or, or a particular power. And they grow and they grow and then they grow so much that they can no longer afford to basically you know, manage that, that level of complexity and growth, and then the negative spirals. It's, so this is something that is has been, you know, constant in human history. Um, but of course, now we, we, we have achieved that at a global level. So we are basically, you know, using too much matter and energy in a, in a way that is too rapid for the earth to restore it and, 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 and beings to restore themselves. Like we're depleting fish, biodiversity crisis, uh, you know, peak resources, all kinds of things are happening at the same time. So degrowth is 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 basically recognizing that and saying, okay, like we are we are using too much of you know the thermodynamic matter energy that is at our disposal, and therefore we need to degrow that level of usage. And that's that's where mutualization come, comes in, right? You, for example, um, let's say you appreciate cars, and cars are useful because they 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 still have point to point transportation, which public transportation cannot have. Well, what you can do is you could, as a neighborhood, you could say, you know, let's let's share the cars in the neighborhood. And so this is associative of cooperative care sharing. So but every shared car replaces nine to 13 private cars without loss of transport. So you have the same level of transport, but you're using nine to 13 times less matter energy, right? So that's a degrowth. But so what I'm trying to explain is that degrowth doesn't mean mis misery. So we can have intelligent, smart degrowth strategies that maintain a maximum complexity of public services while also drastically using, you know, um, and I think there, there, there is a movement now that is monitored by John Takara um, and it's called the Factor 20 Reduction Project. And imagine, so this is, for example, done with commercial transport in a German city. Um, you replace all fossil fuel vehicles with electric vans and cargo bikes. You have the same level of transport with only 5% of the energy used, right? So this is, I think, the way we need to think about it. So degrowth means how can we maintain a good life for everyone and at the same time 
doing that in such a way that we are not destroying nature. Now, right now we are an overshoot, so we need to go down first. And then the second step is steady state. You know, once you achieve a sufficient amount of degrowth, then you can say, well, maybe we should get out of this pulsation, right? Because this pulsation, as long as it was local, it could reheal itself. Once it's global, you know, we cannot afford to re really do that over and over again because there's nowhere to escape. So then we can think, okay, so after a period of degrowth, then how do we achieve steady state so that humanity can live forever, you know, in, in a satisfactory way into a, a finite planet? So that's kind of like the, the, and so where the commons comes in is that it's the regenerative, preservative institution that has already proven in history that it can do that. Like, you know, if you, so why is Switzerland green and Austria and Japan? Well, the mountain flanks are actually, you know, commons of the villagers and they're managed by the villagers for long, long term preservation. Right. Whereas uh, when you look at the private forests and, and mountain flanks and, you know, they're they're being burned down and, and being destroyed. So so it's it's that balance that we need to restore between extractive institutions, markets and states that have to be re embedded uh, in, a, in a higher logic. Uh, and actually that, you know, that was achieved to a certain degree by better by pre-capitalist societies than by, by like, you know, the European Middle Ages were not geared towards uh, material accumulation. Like what they would do is if, you know, if they were growing is they would build a cathedral or, or the feudals would, would have these uh, festivals, you know, where they would fight and, and, but the idea that you know, making money with money was actually taboo in the Middle Ages. And in every traditional society, there was a taboo on usury. Um, and there were, you know, jubilees and clean slate legislation. So all these balancing features, and they never, they never worked perfectly, but they worked better than what we have. Like, we literally have almost no mechanisms to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, right. So one of the things that I like about this, I use the statement, um, a higher logic. Um, right. So this idea that we're not looking here to put forward a um, system of interaction and uh, economics that's looking to negate in the sense of utterly reduce the value that the market plays uh, right. nor is it the case that we're saying that the kind of centralized orchestrating function of the state has no place right. rather <clears throat> looking to see a a um to transform our relationship to these concepts and to see a triad of the you know market as enabling um sort of a true price yeah function yeah we, we yeah so my approach is to change all three actually right so you have so i i think that the commons is another value regime so you have a commodity based value regime that's capitalism and then you have a contribution based value regime and an impact is like the, the negative mirror of contribution. So in, 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 in the market, we exclude all kinds of things that we don't want to look at. And so the, the aim is to you know, broaden the value regime to other contributions and impacts, right? So I, I envision like a three layered system. So, and, and I'll, I'll put it in a formula. What pricing is to the market and planning is to the state, stigmergy is to the commons. Stigmergy is mutual signaling that we know from the bees and, and the ants. So the way they coordinate their activity is by you know, leaving chemical trails. 
that they can you know smell and recognize and then the bees and, and the ants know what to do so if you look at open source production of you know free software open design that's exactly what is happening so you have open transparent systems and a lot of the activity can be managed without prices because people can adjust in real time to the needs of the ecosystem that they can see right and this is called holoptism the capacity to see the whole uh, from every point of peer-to-peer -peer point of view. And so that can be a baseline for many things like work. You know, I do this, you do that, and we can see, and, and okay. The next level is, well, some resources are scarce. They are scarce. You know, there's a lot of things that are not scarce that capitalism makes scarce. So I always say the market is a scarce scarcity management system but capitalism is a, is a scarcity engineering system, right? It, it seeks to create scarcity even when there's no scarcity. But there are scarcities. Right? You know, there's only so much copper in the world. And so then I think markets are could be, could still be, you know, very useful signaling functions, right? But here what we have is we need to think about what is the generative relationship between a market and its players and its institutions and the commons? So can it not be a exploitative relationship? Because if you look at, you know, I, I would argue that capitalism has already turned towards the commons. So we went from what I call a Marxian capitalism, where, you know, you pay people, they produce commodities that you sell at a higher price. That's how you make profit. To a Proudhonian capitalism, where you let people do peer-to-peer -peer stuff, and you and you capture the value of their exchanges and collaboration. So all the new big companies are not old-style capitalist companies that use you know salaried labor. The Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Googles, the Facebooks are all companies that it already exploit our networked activities, right? But they have an exploitative, uh, impoverishing effect. Like you look at Airbnb and it creates an enormous amount of gentrification and it chases you know, middle-class people out of the core of, this, of the cities, right? So that's not a good effect. But we can imagine generative markets that... And so now we have also tools that we didn't have before like crypto and you know we can have intelligent monies uh, and i like the work of uh, holochain and uh, you know arthur brock and when he talks about current seas right so seeing currents so we are now able to have a more, much more fine-grained view of currents and for example there are experiments with things like fish coin so you'd have you'd have a coin and that coin represents the amount of fish you can fish without destroying its capacity for reproduction. So there's only so many fish coins in circulation that actually represent those limits, right? So this is an, one way to envisage how to do this. So this is a whole new way of looking at designing economic systems that are not purely market-based. They're markets related to commons. Yeah. Right. We, and then then the role of the state is in creating frameworks. Right. So you, you either have the idea of centralized planning, right? You know, some centralized uh institution that knows best. Uh and you know we can imagine when we have ecological price, we could have rationing, we can have all kinds of top down systems, right? We can also imagine a new form of the state, which I call the partner state, which you know enables and frames individual and social autonomy through commons-based production. So in that case, for example, you would have this global thresholds and allocations institution, right? Which would say, okay, here is the Mendeleev uh, table of commodities in the world. This is what we can spend every year without going to negative spirals. And this creates the frame, the limiting frame within which the market remains free. 
right? So you, you don't abolish the market. You just say there's a higher framing that protects the common good from individual privatized predatory behavior. Right, right, right. Okay, so there are some really critical concepts here and some really critical ways of, of thinking and situating our relation to being together in the world. Peppered throughout this conversation, and I know the effort of participating, observing, participating again in the rediscovery of the importance of the commons. There's a lot of these different projects, a lot of efforts, a lot of possibilities, and some many seem to me um, hopeful, but yeah. will likely be shown by history to be ineffectual, naive, not yeah. actually capable of addressing what is. And so I'm trying to, so to, to a sort of address the <laughs> listener here, there is a sense in which on the one hand, part of this conversation is trying to clarify some important conceptual ways of thinking. But the actual instantiation systemically, and whenever we invoke words like the state and our whole conception of these entities in our time, is um, it, it does feel to me quite laughable that the present momentum of state function, the individuals which populate the government, are going to come round in the short term to the kind of thinking and the reorientation that is here being invited and sort of hopefully put forward. Yeah. And so I don't, and so I'm, I, I really think that this conversation and, uh, you know, the ongoing relationship to these concepts and situa situating ourselves in this ha has to have that kind of humility to it. Um, yeah. And for certainly for people not like to, not to not to push away this kind of thinking just because of the sometimes sort of impossible naivety that is associated with the genuine attempts to swim against what appears to be the current of our time and yet it is very much the case that we can connect with each other and feel into new currents of possibility and it's that are really worthwhile to um, swim with and to create with. So that's somewhat of a meta point on that. And I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I, here's where I would like to shift gears just a little bit to try and articulate together and feel into what is meant by the common good. Because here is, you know, it's one angle in, I think, to the crux of it. Because we could talk about the common right. good as it, uh, you know, manifests for this group of people in this village with this pasture, and they want to, you know, manage the sustainable regenerative flows of that particular piece of land. They have a commons of interest in that. But that could, I mean, what does that have to do with someone living on the other side of the world or in another country or, you know, so there is a sense in which here is the part where if we, if we really try to understand what the common good is right. at, at a level that's deep enough and profound enough to actually situate ourselves in a cosmo local context right at that level i think we have to um connect and this is you know in some sense what some of my work is about but when people are talking about what kind of new stories what kind of new narratives you know can help to home people in a sense <coughs> of um shared identity however we want to characterize that there's a sense in which how we relate to ourselves and how we communicate about who we are to each other is a kind of commons the, the our very relating to the good itself is a kind of commons. that's a very yeah. abstract thing to say so here's a way that i want to ask you a question just to to wind it back i'd really love to hear if if you if you've reflected on or maybe you could reflect now why is it that you, Michelle, as a person, as a being in the world, 
are interested in this? Like, is it because, because there's a sense in which I'm almost really not, there's part of me that when I hear the word commons, if the language of the soul is not also welcome, then I know, okay, I'm going to have a conversation about economics and whatever, but there's a certain level at which us talking about exchange of resources is going to cut itself off before it really presences its roots. Yeah, you know, what it is right. to be here with each other as as beings here. Like, why do yeah. human beings matter? Why does the common good matter? Like, why why do you care about right. this? So this is a very difficult question. Um, you know, I'm I guess I'm a product of my time, so I'm kind of a you know I, I sometimes call myself post secular uh, in the sense that you know I grew up in an atheistic. Uh, environment. I went to, you know, the Free University of Brussels, which is like the the atheist university uh, in, in my country. Um, at the same time, you know, when I was a young man, I I felt absolutely unhappy about the state of the world and and everything. Um, so my my parents were, you know, coming from this kind of were very poor. You know, went to school until they were 13. When I was a child, we had, you know, leaking roofs and, and I got very sick as a child. And so for my parents, you know, I'm not blaming them, but I'm just saying, you know, for them, that was how they were because they had known hunger and poverty. And I remember my mother saying, happiness is when the fridge is full, right? And that for me as a young, uh, as I was 16, I think when she said that, that was like, that was evil for me. You know, I, I, how can you be like that in the world, right? Where the only thing that counts for you is these material things. So I, you know, I, I was pretty messed up and I undertook, you know, I did seven years of, you know, therapy. You know, I did all the stuff that was popular in the 80s and the 70s, you know. Uh, rebirthing and bioenergetics and I lived in a neo Reichen commune and you know all kinds of stuff um, I work with Stanislas Grof, you know, holotropic mm-hmm. breeding those those kind of things right and then at some point you feel that there's more to life than just you you know you, you kind of into it that there's, there's more right so then I started a journey uh, mostly eastern philosophy in and I did a Rashnish commune. I went to Rashnish Purim in Oregon. You know, if you saw Wild Wild Country, it's a fantastic documentary about what happened there. You uh, you were you were and, part of you were part of Osho's commune. Yeah, well, I I wasn't formally a sannyasin because it's a bit ridiculous. With the, the day I asked to be a sannyasin, I had my shirt wasn't completely red, and they told me, you know, come back uh, another time, and I. I kind of saw it as a sign that I didn't have to, that I, I shouldn't do it because yeah, I was true. very conflicted. You know, it, it was, I, I see Osho as kind of like the the founding of neoliberal man. You know, he, it's liberation from below. So forget your shame, forget your guilt, you know, take care of yourself, feel good and, you know, follow your bliss. But there was also a very strong narcissistic side to it. it yeah. You know, it they weren't helping poor people and sick people. And it was all about, you know, individuals wanting to be more happy and, and all of that, right? Anyway, so I did that. And then I ended up at some point saying, well, why am I always looking elsewhere? You know, maybe there's something in my tradition. So I, I was a Templar. I was a Rosicrucian and I was a Mason. Um, And then I ended up, that was like in my early 30s, with three years of philosophy, right? And I kind of reconciled myself with with being a Westerner and what that meant and the good and the bad of it. And and so I just want, I just kind of tell you that, you know, to show that I I, I was interested in those things. But then in my 30s, I felt, okay, now I, I I did all these things. I need to do something, right? And so I decided now is the time to be creative. So um, I, you know, I had two startups. 
Um, I was editor in chief of a magazine. I did a three hour documentary. Um, and then I ended up with a burnout. I, you know, I had done too many things. I was exhausted. I completely broke down when I was 42. And, <clears throat> and so I did the last job, if you like, in business. Uh, I was a uh, subject for e-business in a, in a very big telco. But I already knew that like all the indicators in the world are going, you know, in black. This is not good. You know, we are, whether it's social signals, the unhappiness of the people within corporations, the meaninglessness of, you know, what a lot of people have to do to, in order to make a living and then what's happening to nature. And my, I thought at that time, like, am I a part of the solution or am I part of the problem? And I felt I'm part of the problem. Like within this environment, I can't do anything positive. And so that's basically the, the birth of my, my interest in, and, you know, my journey to peer to peer was, yeah, I'm going to take two years off to try to understand what I can do today to, you know, be a constructive element in, in, in positive change, right? And I started reading in 2000, 2003, I started for two years, took a full-time two-year sabbatical, and I looked at transitions. Because I thought, you know, Marxism didn't work really, you know, as, as, it, as it thought it would. So what 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 else can we do, right? And that's when I came basically up with the basic ideas that that societies periodically disintegrate, and that the new is actually coming from seed forms that follow a different logic. So it's not evolution; it's actually transvaluation. For example, you know, just to give you an example, the Romans, you know, they didn't work. You know, they managed their estates, but the ideal of a Roman and a Greek was not to work so that they could work on themselves, you know, and be Stoics and Epicureans and um, work was for the slaves. But the Christians, right, which were a proletarian movement originally, they, they hated non-work, you know, and so Christianity said work is good. Work is positive. So the change from you know Roman Empire to the Christian civilization is not an evolution, it's a transvaluation, right? And so anyway, and, and I think so for me the commons is like that. It's a transvaluation, it's not just like a continuation. Um, and it has a spiritual component because what I think we so here, here's how I see it. So you have an existing society. Either it no longer has the means to manage its level of complexity that it has, or some exogenous element comes in that explodes the complexity, like the printing press or the internet. So at that moment, the existing institutional setup is no longer able to manage that level of complexity. And so then the, the ideational glue of the society starts dissolving. And what you get is fragmentation. Fragmentation creates polarization. And so you can see the pagans against the Christians, the Reformation against the Catholics, and today it's the cultural war. So each time that a society reaches like the end of its rope, you know, there is this kind of a chaotic transition. And it's within that transition that the seeds of the future are born. And, you know, it's not always easy to predict that, but I do think, you know, and that's maybe a hubris, but I actually, you know, my hypothesis is that peer-to-peer, -peer, in the sense of this capacity for non-territorial coordination and commoning is the key of the transition today. That's my hypothesis. I could be wrong, of course. Um, and that doesn't tell you anything about what specific form of commoning and P2P is going to work. And also what, you know, what kind of interaction there will be between the bottom and the top, right? I, 
if you don't believe in a fully egalitarian, idealistic, utopian society, then you have to accept that there will be some form of stratification in the society that is coming. And how will that stratification will be? On what will it be based? Right? And this is, they're all very difficult questions. I don't have the answers to all of them. But the, the way commoning is also spiritual is, is in terms of identity, right? We are now regressing in terms of identity. So if you are, you know, this is the ideas of David Goodhart and Matthew Goodwin. So if you are a somewhere, like a working class person or a small business person, and you can't really leave your soil. You know, you're linked to the territory. You're going to go back to maybe the nation state, like you're nostalgic of the way things were. You want to re re reinforce the nation state. Or maybe you fall back on your ethnicity. You know, you want Catalonia to be independent from Spain. Uh, maybe uh, your religion. You know, Iran, 1979, right? So there's, there's, but so they're kind of rooted identities that, but they can be regressive because they're, they're smaller than what, what used to be. If you're rootless, and that's how I personally, you know, and very controversially <laughs> identify identity politics. So if you're nowhere, then really, then there's nothing left and say, well, you know, I'm, white, I'm black, I'm gender this, I'm, you know. And so both sides of this of this fragmentation, polarization, have a regressive tendency in terms of identity. You know, if the state, if the, em the empire no longer takes care of us, like who can defend us? And so then you go to, to things that are less complex, less grand, um, and the commons for me is a way to kind of at least partially escape that. It's like my identity, okay, I'm rooted locally. I need the soil, I need the animals, I need my community. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good, right? At the same time, in order to thrive locally, I need to be connected with these global streams of knowledge of science and technology and you know cooperative and cooperative endeavors, right? And so I have a cosmo-local identity, right? I, I extend my local identity, which could be very regressive and the fight of every community against every community, but I combine it with something that's higher than myself, which is a transcendent purpose, a social object that makes the world a better place. So I improve my local and I improve the global at the same time. Okay, that's that's a bet. I don't know if it's gonna work, but I'm I'm betting that this is better than those two other solutions that we have today. Yeah, I hear you, and that was nicely articulated. I think there's um there's a lot there that I appreciate, and well, maybe I'll do this because I did highlight a paragraph that I was going to read out. And it's in part without the spiritual aspect, which I want to return to. I think it echoes and restates, in a way, the sum total of the argument put forward so far. Right. And it's one of the passages that is a preliminary <clears throat> conclusion, as you say. So I'll just read that out might work nicely for a clip or something we'll see so we are both going through a meta historical event the loss of our balance with nature at a global level and a change within the cycles of capitalism both these temporal events which both lead to a re-strengthening of the commons are converging in one single global process which brings the necessity of a re-emergence of the commons to the fore. The essential argument here is that we can no longer afford the wave-pulse alternation. Thus, after a period of degrowth, we must actually achieve an integrated, stable society. This means that, rather than a continuation of the cycles throughout human history, 
we must now be able to shift to a more stable, integrated or integral civilization. This means that the commons must become the central integrating human institution, not just as a temporary pharmacon medicine for a temporary illness, but as a permanent feature of a steady state society. Did I write this? Uh, I believe it's yourself and a collaborator of yours. Yes. All right. Yeah. 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 For, for um, crunch. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's that's a good summary. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a nice it's a nice summary. So. So can I can I say something because you mm -hmm. know this is something that I I struggle with. It's so. All, all the big changes, trans revelations, were also spiritual changes. And actually, there is a Toynbee, a macro historian, Arnold Toynbee, the study of history. So he he says, okay, the last stage of a civilization is a universal state. A universal state means that you know one power is dominating the whole civilization, like you know Rome dominates the whole Hellenic uh, world, and then it starts declining. And as it starts declining, it says, then you get universal church. In other words, the people lose trust in the state and start self-organizing around new spiritual values, right? So that's the Christians. But you know, you can you can find examples in the other civilizations. And and then you know the the state dissolves, the barbarians come in, you know, the Germanic tribes take over. And as they are not able to manage the complex system that they're taking over, they actually need to make agreements with the universal church. And that becomes in the seed form of the new society. So that, you know, that works for Christianity, but it gives examples from different civilizational spheres. And I, I must admit that this is a, you know, this is like a mystery to me. Like, what, what is the universal church today? I have no idea. I, I you know, there's a lot of, new agey stuff happening, you know, like this kind of like, you know, a bit vague spirituality that exists with a bit of Buddhism and a bit of that. But to be honest, I, I don't see it, right? I, I, I have a hard time seeing what that could be. So right. this is maybe okay. <laughs> a question no, awesome. to you. Uh, but, you know, yeah. So, okay. So, um, let me see if I can do some contemplation with some of the threads that are here. And yeah. uh, knowing we don't have quite enough time to dialogue on it properly, maybe there'll be something in there which is interesting we can return to. And yeah. I'll, in, you know, in what follows, I'll invite those who are listening and particularly other, you know, Voicecraft members who, who listen to this podcast. We'll meet to have a discussion about this perhaps and, and we'll take the conversation on. And Okay. So to try and incorporate some of the language that we've touched on, it seems like one of the fundamental considerations, constraints that commons thinking is holding absolutely core is how we integrate with the energetic cycles and permutations of the life world we're a part of. Yeah. And in principle, that extends to the the cosmic organismic as well. In that, of course, the Earth is. Part yeah, I, you of know Earth. the way I see it is like depth, right? So the the traditional spiritual is height. You know, you have the vertical relation with the cosmic, and then you have like a, a deepening of the connection with the Earth, right? And mm. and and both are connected, and and so mm. I think I see the commons more as that mm. second thing. It's it's you know it's seeking a new relationship with the biophysical earth mm. right it's yeah, not I, I, necessarily it doesn't have an explicit cosm you know divine theory maybe it could have but i i don't see that well as I, that. I i i hear you i mean you, you do make a you do make an explicit statement that um the common good doesn't have to be metaphysical in the in the in the textbook that you've written so that the, i i see you making that move to it's almost like hang on a second you don't have to swallow some metaphysics some religious identity i'm not trying to lay you know belabor you with something and that actually we can be a bit more down to earth and recognize 
Well, uh, can, can I say I, I I I'd like to say why I write this is because there are commoners that are very much into you know like you have to convert, right? Like you you have to be anti-capitalist. You have to be you know no market in the commons at all, right? And I'm reacting against that. It's I kind of like the the hippie side of the commons, I and I I think that's naive and utopian. And I, I think that's, you know, I could be wrong, but that's what I think, right? And that's why I stress this kind of a bit more realistic vision that you have to take people as they are. You don't have to require from them to convert to any particular point of view. You know, uh, it's it's object-oriented sociality. Above all, it's a pragmatic choice to make the world a better place by engaging together in constructing something. Yep. But you know, I, I can have different ideas than you about many, many other things that shouldn't prevent us from commenting together or in a particular context. We can fight in another context, but in the context of, let's say, doing an open source project, we are united around that open source project. And that's good enough. Anyway, yes. that's, that's well, kind of know, the idea. I hear you. I, I hear the wrestle. And I, I, I appreciate your stance in relationship to that. And it's certainly what you're, what you're saying is don't be ideological about this. We actually have to think, right. like really think about it. And it, and that's, you know, yeah. one of the reasons why I, I like your work. It's interesting though, how you say, um, you know, we can collaborate over here and maybe we can fight over here. And like, that's true, but can we fight about everything like, is there are there some things actually we can't fight about is there something to the common good right that that can right. only be we can only be in service to that common good if we well, maintain I, I can, that continuity of collaboration well, I, I can tell you that's why i'm in trouble with you know with identity politics and, and the woke movement right is because i took a stance against that and said so when people start saying you can talk because you're male, because you're white, because you're old, because X, Y, Z, because you're an oppressor, right? At that moment, they deny my personhood. And, uh, you know, I'm not talking just about me, I'm talking in general, right? And it really the commons has to be based on contribution, irrespective of those things. Like you're a human being, you have qualities and defaults, and the commons creates an open system where anybody can contribute the good that is in them that could serve that common purpose, right? We there is no there is no possibility in the commons to say you are getting X and you are getting Y because you are, you know, whatever your biology is. This is just for me, you know, and that's why I got into trouble. You know, it's totally incompatible. You cannot build the commons on those principles. I and agree. so I find it extremely regressive and I'm, you know, I, I paid a heavy price for it, I can tell you, by opposing this. But in a commons, you cannot accept that people judge each other on anything else than there being a person that is contributing to the common purpose. You know, and, and that has to be for me a very strong principle. And I will just not work with any people tell me that I don't have a voice or that somebody else doesn't have a voice because of X, Y, Z. That is totally incompatible with the commoning approach. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I will make no compromise on that, on that principle, whatever the cost. Right. Well, there we go. So, so, so I hear you. So I hear you. You know, if, if we were to have another hour of conversation, I think what I'm about to say would unfold over more words, but that sounds to me like like a metaphysical conviction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You cannot prove it, right? So, and, and I don't know if you know Herman Doyerweert. He he talks about ground motives. He's a you know he's a reformed theologian. And and I I strongly believe this that you know whatever we are, we are the product of a long history, right? And in in our case, because I think that it goes for you as well we come out of a very long evolved Christian culture, right? And the, the thing is, 
we must be conscious of this. Because if we're not conscious of those, then we get perversions of those principles, right? And so that's that I think it, it often happens in you know Marxism, Nazism, and I think wokeism is that you know these these con- unconscious gnostic drives push people to certain positioning, and they're not sufficiently aware of what what is it in 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 their kind of cultural makeup that actually drives them to those choices, right? So th- there's nothing more dangerous than an unconscious religion. I you know I I prefer a conscious religion, a real religion than a fake religion. And you know maybe we can talk another time. You know I've thought a lot about this uh, yeah. issue, yeah. Um, and I've you know I've read a number of authors like Eric Vergelin who you know talk about political gnosticism, right? And so you know the basic idea is that in the 16th century we stopped believing in transcendent, largely as a Western civilization right and then we projected the hopes of transcendence into the real physical world right and that is what gives us our technological drive and transhumanism and and other things that are now kind of becoming a negative mirror uh of those transcendent drives they're becoming like you know real physical nightmares because they are they are driven by these unconscious desires that we don't recognize as such right well yeah i I would i would love to return for another conversation and and maybe we can figure out a a context in which to have that which could invite a few other voices in to help along the discussion um there's there's a there's so much here there's so much here to say which i won't say and actually here's the thing Sorry, sorry for taking all yeah, the yeah, time. No, no, no. I, I, yeah. sorry, I'm, de- I'm definitely not going to open up a clearing here now and, and start to do some real uh, contemplation. But what I will, what I will ask, one is, um, because I, to, in, in, in the, in the short time we have left, um, one's a, one's a, a lighter question. They're, they're both actually light questions. The, I'll ask them at the same time. The first is, you mentioned, uh, the Masons, Rosicrucians, Templars. I'm not sure how much you were part of those organizations but i would like to i would like to ask what was something you learned in your participation in those organizations that is still with you today and is valuable and the second thing i'd like to ask is what is most hopeful for you in terms of current ongoing efforts at what you would see as efforts towards the uh, you know we could say a kind of a rediscovery and a and uh, yeah. these planting the seeds of, of the commons. Okay, so the, the first answer is that, you know, whenever, whenever you have a dominant religion, it, it represses things, right? It, it, it There's things that it allows us, things that it doesn't allow. It, it you know, it creates kind of like a boundary uh, system. And so there are a lot of things in the West that were repressed by the Christian Catholic kind of uh, hegemony. And so, you know, we're talking about the Hermetic tradition. We're talking about the Neoplatonic tradition. Uh, And so I think that these organizations that we're talking about, right, are repositories of this different kind of approach. And the, the way they but it's deposited in rituals, right? And, and in symbols. And so what is it, what, what's interesting in, because, you know, they're basically the same, you know, they're just kind of different iterations, but the basic idea, you know, it's, it's a spiritual order where the guru is the ritual, right? And so you have different levels of initiation. Each level of initiation is a psychodrama. And the, the goal of the adept, if you like, is to understand the spiritual reality be, behind that psychodrama. And so that's, and that's the way, right? That's this particular way, but it has a lot of interesting aspects. For example, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a fairly egalitarian system because, you know, yes, you have levels, you know, like apprentice, fellow, uh, and master. 
but it's like a how do you call that? It's co it, their cooptation mechanisms, right? You you can you are you get to be an apprentice because you're accepted first. Then you get a fellow when the fellows accept you that you are at their level, and a fellow becomes a master when he's accepted by the other masters being at their level, right? And then you have within the the lodge structures you have a rotational system whereby the different positions are rotated, and once you are at the top, you go down again. Hmm. So there, there's a lot of beautiful elements in these structures. But of course, you know, I don't want to idealize them I, because, you know, they are human structures. So then uh, they end up creating obediences. The obedience end up competing with each other. And, you know, all kinds of stuff happen that is not what you'd like to see, but seems endemic in any human institution, spiritual or non-spiritual, right? Uh, but the the advantage of formal spiritual organizations is that they have checks and balances. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's an advantage of actually being an institution and not being a purely charismatic expression, because that's what I I, I experienced with with Osho, right? Is that there's there's no counterpower at all. So you know, the guru the guru nominates a secretary. And she becomes the all powerful dictatorial right. it's manager of the whole system. Yeah. 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 I was in it, man. And I can wow. you know, I can also talk hours about oh, wow. the stuff that, would be... that, that I experienced there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. But I it... had no idea about your background in that. That that opens up some some interesting angles into this, absolutely. It does yeah. feel like there's a whole part two here which uh which I which I would love to have, but in just in finishing, then, um, what are you seeing at the moment that you're inspired by? Okay, so the, I think we need to make the shift in the commons towards capital and common property. So, if you're too equal, and you continuously, you know, disperse the surplus, you cannot accumulate any social power. So I think the priority today is, you know, like a community land trust or cooperative housing or, you know, buying land for the farmers. You, we need to actually own things. Uh, and so, for example, there's a nice project in the Netherlands called Hereboeren, and they want to buy 64,000 acres of land and then collectively own them as consumers and then and then rent them out to to uh, organic farmers this this is the stuff we need to do you know like the equivalent of the congregations in the middle ages you know where you have saint benedict and saint bernard who from zero create you know like a viral mechanism you know the the monastery which has to split when they reach a certain level. I think it's 48. And then as a bee swarm, they go somewhere else and they repeat. And within 70 years, you know, they develop 70% of the agricultural land in Europe. Mm. So we need these kinds of expansive commons, not just like PPDP, you know, small is beautiful. We actually need, you know, these, these things. Beautiful. Thank you, Michelle. Lovely to have this conversation. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you so much. And and uh, yeah, I you know I like to do that stuff, and discuss and, and and also listen to other people. So yeah, great. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the journey. You can visit Voicecraft.io to find out more about this project, the network, the mailing list, opportunities to participate, upcoming courses in the Voicecraft Academy, as well as access the show notes for this episode. At voicecraft.io. And thank you as always to the patrons of the podcast at patreon.com slash voicecraft. That's where you can pledge a small amount each month to support this work. And if you can't support the podcast in that way, but you value this content and appreciate its values and purpose, then leave a review or share it to someone else you think will. All right. Thank you for being here.